Okay, good afternoon, uh, Year 11. Welcome to the, the final online learning session for GCSE Chemistry. Well done getting to this point if you've been to all the sessions. Uh, so your final session will be delivered by Mrs. Stevens again. Um, she'll be reviewing uh, the topic on crude oil, which will be obviously important for both your GCSE exams and for a if you go on. So I will now pass you over to Mrs. Stevens. Remember, I'm on the chat for you if you need me. So Mrs. Stevens, if you'd like to begin. Good evening, um, and as, I, as Mr. Black said, welcome to the last session. So crude oil, to a certain degree, is probably something that is relatively recent if most schools teach in the order that the units come up in year 11. OK, nonetheless, though, it is um, a very important subject that is quite substantial and the fact that it appears in nearly every um, past paper that's been in place over the last probably decade. OK, so crude oil. Something that you touched upon very early in secondary school, I'm sure, OK, but maybe didn't um, develop your understanding of it until year 11. So crude oil, most of, uh, most of you are, I'm sure, aware that it's this kind of gunky black solid um, so, um, liquid that we get from the seabed, etc. OK, um, but crude oil needs to be understood in far more detail. Um, for the purpose of any assessments that you might undertake over the next few weeks. OK, so going back to basics of what was built upon from your key stage three understanding then. So how crude oil was formed. Now it is expected that you are able to recall the fact that um, it was created from microscopic plants and animals that died over a very long time ago, hence the word um, fossil, because it's an example, as I'm sure you are aware, of the three fossil fuels that were um, created millions of years ago. So you've got crude oil, natural gas and coal. Um, the only one we develop um, in any sort of detail is crude oil. OK, so formed from macroscopic plants and animals that died a very long time ago that fell to the seabed. OK, it built up over a period of time in layers of sand and mud. Sediment, um, sedimentation therefore landing on top of each other in layers, OK, as doing so, compressing it down, causing great pressure and temperature um, to come into play. And that caused this formation of this extremely useful raw material that we now recognise as crude oil, OK? Now, I'm sure you've also seen some um, documentation of the kind of document documentaries of the years of drilling for oil, OK, or seen any sort of good films like Armageddon, big fan of Armageddon. So you, you probably have this understanding of how we obtain oil by drilling down to the seabed. Most of the time it's on the seabed. There are some examples that are um, land based, but primarily for us, it's certainly um, our source of crude oils out in the North Sea, etc. OK, now crude oil as it stands, which is this kind of viscous, gloopy black substance that we get from the seabed, isn't that useful in itself? OK, despite the fact that we get out to crude oil, a massive range of extremely useful substances. So you're expected to understand the fractions or the sections that we get out to crude oil that are extremely useful. So, um, things that are containing crude oil, which most people might not actually recognise, all come from one source, which is this crude oil. So you've got things like petrol, diesel, um, naphtha, bitumen that we put on road surfaces, all these kind of camping gases that you're familiar with, like um, butane and pen, um, propane. OK, so these gases, um, petroleum jelly. OK, all of these are actually sourced from one raw material. But it, as it is in this raw state, it's not that useful. So we need to separate it out into all these useful things that we want to um, obtain in order to use or to sell on, etc. OK, so the oil industry is all kind of circulating around the fact that we've got this very valuable resource, but we need to separate it into its components or sections. And we call those um, sections or bits. Um, fractions. OK, so the sort of fractions that you might be familiar with, as I said, OK, so you've got 
these um, sort of fractions. I'll explain to you in a second what these pictures are. OK, so you've got the um, liquid petroleum gases. So the camping gases that you might be familiar with or, you know, you see these gas canisters that you can purchase for your caravan, etc. Petrol. Now, by by a far distance, this is the one that usually my year 11s are immediately on the ball with that they recognise comes from oil. So they know that petrol comes from crude oil. OK, you've got naphtha, um, you've got paraffin, you've got diesel oil, you've got diesel fuel, fuel oil. Lubricating oil like engine oils, etc. And then, as I mentioned earlier, you've got this bitumen um, fraction that we use for road surfacing, etc. Now, they all come from one raw material, which is this crude oil. But the interesting about them, a uh, bit about them, is that each of them um, have very different properties, primarily um, arising from the fact that each fraction or section has got a different carbon length. So each of these, um, or primarily each of these, contains a class of compound called a hydrocarbon, which I'm going to come to in a second. OK, but depending on the length of that carbon chain within that hydrocarbon, it results in them having very radically different boiling points. So if I take you back to your year 10 knowledge um, where you did distillation, in the unit on water, it came across and you came across the science that you can separate liquids um, into different portions dependent on their boiling point. So we know we knew from year 11, for example, if you try to separate water and ethanol, you do it by simple dis distillation because water boils at 100 and ethanol boils at 78. So you've always kind of known in the back of your head um, that different boiling points gives rise to an easy-ish method of separation. Now, I said easy-ish there because you can't um, escape the fact that it's not as simple as just bringing them in a container and just boiling it and evap um, evaporation and condensation in a single vessel because it contains so many different fractions and different sections. So you need to bring in a slightly more complex process called fractional distillation based on the same principle, which is this boiling point. OK, so um, we've got the boiling points. You can see there that, that um, the shorter ones that come out the top, these are like the liquid petroleum gases, they have boiling points that generally lie beneath the room temperature, okay, or 25 degrees centigrade. That is what leads them to being ga gaseous at room temperature. The gases because their boiling points are below. So they've not only melted, but they've um, evaporated as well. So petroleum has got a um, I'm sure you know, a relatively volatile nature, so it's quite flammable um, and it vaporises really easily. So petrol um, vaporises easily because its boiling point is so very low in a sense. It's 25 to about 60 degrees as a range. And as you can see, as you get down to the lower members of the um, fractions or the lower fractions there, they become longer. And in doing so, um, their boiling point increases. So they range them from the gases at the top. And then as you move your way down, they become, um, so you've got gases up here. Um, then you've got the liquids as you go down. That's a G, sorry. And then as you go down, you've got the solids um, nearer the bottom. OK, so they change in their physical state from gaseous to liquid to solid based on the fact that their boiling points vary. OK, so. If I just quickly get rid of these, so you can see what's about to come up. Average number of carbon chains then, so how long this hydrocarbon is, uh, it ranges from being the relative short one um, and you'll come across the naming probe. Um, later on in this presentation. So a carbon chain of three, um, one of which would be therefore propane, which I'm sure you've seen on gas canisters before now. So propane has got three carbons and as they get longer and longer, all the way down to bitumen, which is on average a length of about 120 carbons in a row. OK, so properties. Not only do they vary in their boiling points, they vary quite radically in other properties as well. OK, both physically and chemically. So the ease of lighting, so um, how easily they light or how flammable they are. OK, as they get longer, 
they um, become slightly more challenging to light. So they become more difficult to set a light. So less flammability. OK, that's one property. They also become progressively uh, more viscous and gloopy. OK, so they go from being very, very runny to being excessively hard to pour. OK, so it becomes much, much more solidified and viscous, it's called. So how thick a substance it is. OK. Now, based upon the fact that they've got these um, different or actually if I just go back one, another major property that may be worthwhile if they come and ask you about these variations from shorter chains to longer chains is that there are other two other properties that are commonly noted down, which is how dark they are. So um, they become progressively darker as well. So you'd have picked up on that like petrol is a light kind of yellowy liquid. OK, as, as it got, gets longer down to bitumen, it becomes a black substance. OK, so they become darker as well in nature. And um, they also tend to, if they are burning, they also tend to become um, more dirty as a flame. So they are progressively getting um, more soot given off as they are burning. So you have to remember these sort of properties of flammability, how viscous they are, how cleanly they burn, and all of these linked to how long the chain is. If you just give me a second. OK, so. Um, just to go on to what I was saying there, linked to the fact that they've got these different properties such as how easily they burn, how dark they are, how viscous they are, it then extends themselves into having very different applications or uses. So we know that the shorter ones are commonly used as um, camping gases for cooking, etc. Gasoline, petrol, I'm sure needs no um, explanation. We use it to fuel vehicles, OK? Um, as you go down, you can see there that um, you've got diesel oil then that we know, hopefully, or you um, hopefully know, um, powers heavier vehicles possibly, so lorries, etc. And then you've got the bitumen, the very longest chain that you could possibly see um, that is used to surface roads, etc. OK, so yes, they all have very different properties, but linked to that, you can then apply it to different um, uses as well. OK, sometimes you don't want something flammable. OK, um, and there's also, also always this kind of debate of whether the shorter ones make the best fuel. Well, it depends what you want to do it, with it, isn't it? OK, you might not want a highly volatile, highly flammable substance. OK, so the uses that you put these fractions to is usually closely related to what properties they have and also what you want to use it for. OK. Right, so hydrocarbons, the word I used earlier, and I'm hoping that you can all see that it's made up of um, two sections to the word. OK, so it contains two elements, as I'm sure you're there for aware, and the two elements are carbon and hydrogen. So hydro based on the fact that it contains hydrogen atoms and carbon based upon the fact that it contains a carbon. OK, so it's a molecule that tends to only contain these two atoms. OK. So um, based upon that, there are then within these two distinct families that you need to be familiar with. OK, so hydrocarbons is any compound that contains um, just these two and hydrocarbons are pretty much the only family or the only type of compound that comes out of these um, this process of fractional distillation. OK. So hydrocarbons are compounds that contain just these two elements, but they can be combined um, in a variety of ways. Some um, and two is I will come across um, later on is they can be saturated or they can be unsaturated. Now that's linked to whether you've got single bonds present or double bonds. So yet again, it kind of ties over to that very first unit you did in your 11, which was the bonding unit, which I think if I remember correctly, um, Mr Black did as his first session a few weeks back. OK, so we've got two distinct families, the first of which is saturated and they are called the alkanes. OK, now alkanes and alkenes is the other family, but based upon what family 
you we are discussing, you have to be able to recall the general formula for that um, specific family of hydrocarbons. So alkanes are mathematically always going to be worked out using this. OK, so it is, is a case of if you know, it's like maths and it's, um, to a certain degree, and I keep telling them it's like the nth term in maths. If you know how many carbons you have, you can automatically work out how many hydrogens you have within that alkane by multiplying by two and adding two. OK, so um, if you've got, I don't know, um, if you've got 12 carbons, let's say C12, OK, then you can work out without even recognising that um, compound. You don't have to know the name of it, but you should be able to tell me that it would therefore have 12 times 2, 24 plus 2, 26 um, hydrogens. OK, so it's a general formula of which you are expected to be able to recall. OK, they don't necessarily have to give that to you. It is an expected piece of information. Now, naming them yet again is closely related to how many carbons um, are within that compound. So let's say it has um, traditionally one carbon, then it would start with the prefix okay, of meth. Okay, moving on from that, then you've got the same kind of prefix if you've got two, three, four upwards. Okay, so alkanes are called, the first three members are called methane, hence signifies the presence of one carbon, meth. Second one is ethane, eth, um, signifies the presence of two. And then you've got propane, which signifies the presence of three. So as you can see, all of these formulas conform to the earlier one I told you about, which is that general formula of doubling it and adding two. OK, because look, methane's got one, double one, two plus two is four. OK. Ethane, same sense, double it, four, add two, six. So they all conform to that expected formula you are now familiar with, which is CN, H2N plus two. OK, now this description um, I used earlier of saturation means that you can see that in the diagram, all the bonds are single bonds. So carbon has this ability based on the fact that it's in car in group four of bonding four times okay that is its aim is to get a full valent or outer shell isn't it and the best way of getting a full shell if you are carbon is to somehow bond with four other things so linking quickly back to the session mr black did it's really difficult in group four to bond ionically because you're smack bang in the middle. So you've got four valence electrons. So it's not it's really quite tricky to contemplate losing four or somehow finding an extra four. So they bond covalently. So they overlap their outer shells in order to share electrons. OK, and they have carbon has the ability to share overlap four times with four different things. So we describe alkanes because it bonds to four separate species. We call that saturated. OK, so alkanes, this is this the um, verse that I teach my kids. You don't have to know all of them. They've kind of reduced the expectation um, of how many prefixes you're meant to be familiar with. You have to know up to six quite confidently. So meth, f, prop, but, it's not but, my year 11 seem to think it's hilarious just to call it, but but, pent. Then it becomes slightly easier because they become more related to your maths and they become mathematical in their nature. So you've got like pentagon, hexagon. So you can link it to your knowledge of maths then, can't you? OK, then it becomes hept, oct, non and dec as in a decade. OK, so I, I, I used to teach my kids the verse monsters eat pupils but prefer hairy haggis or nice dinners. It doesn't matter what your rhyme is, as long as I do, I'm a big fan of these rhymes to help you remember things, OK? I will, however, um, highlight the fact that up to six is the only expectation for you, really. But I do suggest that it is sensible to be able to recall decade, but that's related to having a decade, so 10 years. And also, I tell my pupils that having a good, quick knowledge of octane is also sensible because octane is the main part or component that petrol which is often examined on um is so petrol is um, mostly octane in nature okay so having up to six as a prefix is expected but as a 
good idea to have Oct and Deck as a kind of quick recall as well. So you can see there the pictures, methane, ethane, propane. I'll emphasize again, it is really important that you acknowledge that all these bonds are singular. It's a single bond, so they're sharing one electron from each species. So the hydrogen, if you relate it to the bonding of dot and cross, these would constitute the dot and cross for each one. Yeah, so it is important, however, for the rest of this presentation, that you have a clear understanding that these are three dimensional uh, molecules. Okay, they're not flat on the paper. OK, they will get themselves into a three dimensional shape, a 3D shape. And in doing so, it's important that you appreciate for later on that this um, is a plane of rotation. So you can take this and spin it around. OK, so it's, called, it's described as having free rotation, which another family doesn't have, which is the alkenes will come on to hopefully. OK, so there's free rotation around these three dimensional shapes that alkanes get themselves into. So these shapes. So how many bonds can carbon make? Well, as I said, it can do four. OK, why? Well, it's in group four. So it wishes to bond four times to get full shell. OK. Can any more hydrogen be added? Well, if you go back to the previous one, OK, you can see that it's saturated. You can't fit any more hydrogen on there. OK, it's probably also a good idea at this point. OK, that each carbon in a picture needs to have four lines touching it. And each hydrogen, because hydrogen is in the first shell or first period, OK, it only needs two electrons to make it full. It's got one of its own, so it can only bond one more time. And that's important, OK, that you appreciate that carbon has to have four lines touching it in a diagram, but hydrogen can only ever have one line touching it, OK? So to be clear, saturated means it can't accept any more hydrogens onto itself. So linking back quickly to your year 10 and another place you came across the word saturated, which is water, when you can't dissolve any more um, solute into a solvent, we call that solution saturated. Well, in the same sense, a saturated hydrocarbon like this can't take on any more hydrogens, it can't accept any more hydrogens, OK? So hydrocarbons or the alkanes are that useful except as fuels. OK, so most alkanes are used primarily as fuels because they produce um, plentiful energy. OK, they give off lots of energy when you burn them or combustion takes place with them. OK, when you burn any um, hydrocarbon because it's hydrocarbons, hydrogen and carbon. OK, think. The um, gas present, yet again, linking into your um, your level knowledge in the fire triangle. OK, and the fact that oxygen is required for combustion, you take carbon and burn it in oxygen, you will make carbon dioxide. If you burn hydrogen and it takes on oxygen from the air, then it will make water, which is water um, hydrogen oxide, isn't it? OK, now when hydrocarbons burn, a lot of energy is released. OK, and complete combustion of it only produces those two products, which is carbon dioxide and water. Now, it does produce other um, minor products, shall we say, based on, for example, if there is insufficient oxygen, then it might well produce carbon monoxide, not desirable because of its toxic nature. And also because a lot of these um, fuels, um, specifically, it used to be the diesel fraction, has had a um, has a proportion of impurities like sulfur in it. It can also produce things like sulfur dioxide causing acid rain. So yet again, linking it back to year 10 unit, OK? But if you think of it exclusively as just the hydrocarbon, OK, so just the methane itself or just the um, octane itself, it will only produce carbon dioxide and water, OK? Now, equations for combustion is something that is, um, again, expected of you. So you're meant to realise that it always combines with oxygen, which is diatomic. OK, so oxygen goes around in a pair, doesn't it? And it will always produce carbon dioxide and water. OK, 
Now, if you look at that and how you then need to balance it, well, I tell my kids, start with the carbons. If you notice that, how many carbons can you make? Well, I've only got one um, carbon presence in methane, so I'll only ever be able to make one carbon dioxide. OK, I then move on to the hydrogen. I've got four hydrogens there, haven't I? Because water contains two atoms of hydrogen, four atoms of hydrogen present in methane will be able to produce two molecules of water then, won't it? OK, to use up all four atoms, because at the core of chemistry and your teacher, I'm sure will point this out to you, balancing is not to be just pedantic and be a pain in the backside is because you can't create any atoms, but you can't get rid of them either just to make the balancing easy. OK, you have to get exactly the same number of atoms both sides of your equation. So if they're there at the beginning, they're going to have to be there somewhere at the end. OK, so we've got four atoms of hydrogen, so we're going to make two molecules of water. So balancing that, OK, requires you then to look at the oxygen's presence. So because I made two molecules of water and I made one molecule of oxygen, well, that's going to be two atoms of oxygen there. And each water molecule contains one oxygen. So in two molecules, you'll have two. So you've got four in total, haven't you? Yeah. And because I'll emphasize again, water, sorry, oxygen is diatomic. You're going to therefore be able to make two molecules or it requires two molecules of oxygen. OK, so it's the same principle you'd use for any of them. OK, be it uh, methane or like the next one I show you. OK, it could be propane. OK, look how many um, carbons do I have? So I've got three, so I'm going to make three carbon dioxides. I've got eight hydrogens, so I can make four molecules of water. OK, looking then at how many oxygens I have present on my right hand side, I have 10 atoms of oxygen. So that would therefore require me to have five molecules of oxygen at the start to allow this combustion to occur. OK. And then um, this is another family called ethene. OK, I wouldn't stress too much about now. I'll come back to it later if there's time. But ethene is another family called a uh, hydrocarbon. But it's the same principle. Look at how many carbons you have. Look how many hydrogens you have and then work out how much you need to make it um, completely combust. OK, so I can in theory make two carbon dioxides, two waters, because I've got four hydrogens to use up in a sense. And if you look at the number of oxygen atoms present, you've got two times two, which is four here. And then you've got two times one, which is two, making it a total of six. Yeah. And therefore I need three diatomic oxygen molecules. OK. So combustion only occurs, and I'll emphasize it again, um, insufficient oxygen will only produce carbon dioxide and water. OK, so you could prove that these are the only two um, products using a simple demonstration of if you burn it and then pass the products, which are gaseous through crushed ice and water, that will cause it to condense and you'd get a collection of water here. OK, and then you can continuously um, pass it through a second vessel which contains lime water. And because you're producing carbon dioxide, it will turn the lime water milky or cloudy. OK, so that's just a, a simple demonstration that if time allows, I always show my um, year 11 pupils that I'm not lying to them. It does always produce water and it does always produce um, carbon dioxide. OK. Right, I want to then move on and focus on this term here, which is isomerism. OK, now isomer as a definition is something you need to be able to regurgitate or describe. OK, so an isomer is some as a compound that has the same formula, but a different structure. OK, focus on this. I told you earlier. Carbon always forms four bonds. Hydrogen forms um, one. I didn't mention it earlier, but oxygen always has two lines touching it. OK, 
Now, if I said butane, most people would go, right, OK, I could work out that it is therefore going to be C4 because the prefix is but, OK? General formula for an alkane is double it and add two, so that would be the formula of butane. OK, however, OK, and this is what we need to focus on. If you draw it, that's what it would look like. But if I said, instead of saying draw me butane, if I just said I've got a compound that is C4 H10. Does it necessarily mean I've got butane? Well, the answer is no. OK, because you can take the same four carbon atoms, the same 10 hydrogen atoms, still abide by the rule of each carbon has to touch four things, each hydrogen has to touch one thing, but actually rearrange it into um, a structure that isn't necessarily having them all in a straight line. OK, there's another way of doing it, which is, as you can see there, having three in a line and then having one going off the central one. Now, people say, right, OK, I can draw another way, miss. And I went, OK, go on then. Crack on, show me what you're doing. And they seem, and this is really important that you get your heads around this, is that a straight line doesn't necessarily have to be straight. And I know that plays havoc with your brains, but if you work with me and just sit tight for a second or two, what I'm saying by that is when I'm talking about a line, I'm just simply referring to an unbroken chain of carbon. So if um, we have carbon in a line, I could have them as there as an unbroken line of one, two, three, four. Yeah, but then you can also have them going one, two, three, and then as the cracked one was, the fourth one coming off the central one. So if you look at how many um, unbroken carbons I'm striking, I can only go one, two, three, and then somehow can't get to the fourth one without somehow repeating back on myself and then going downwards, which isn't therefore a straight line. It's unbroken um, line is three, not four. OK, so I get to saying, well, I could just go one, two, three, and then have the fourth one coming off the last one, miss. And that's different, even though it looks different. If you refer back to what I said earlier, is that these aren't flat on the paper. These are three dimensional. OK, and if you look at it, I have still got an unbroken line of one, two, three, four. Yeah, I still have an unbroken. I can go from the first one to the fourth one without lifting my pen off the paper, which means it is still classed as a straight line or an unbroken line. OK, so that is not different. OK. That is still four carbons in a row. So there are, in fact, only two ways you can draw four carbons and 10 hydrogens and be different, which is having them in a totally straight line. And being lazy as I am, I'm not going to bother putting in the hydrogens, but you can assume that at the end of each of those lines, there'd be a hydrogen. And then you've got three in a line. And then the fourth one coming off the central one, which means that the longest unbroken line I have there is in fact three. OK, but I still have four present in total. and I still have 10 hydrogens present in total. Now this is this is very high. This is higher tier without a doubt. OK, but it is well worth investing um, some time in getting good understanding of this because it is a very common as I say, top end question that might appear. OK, it's like a question that's often used to differentiate between, I don't know, a B candidate and an A candidate, maybe. OK, so if you're aiming for those stars, try get your head around isomers. So same thing can be said for pentan. OK, pent as a pentagon in maths would refer to is five in nature. So we know that we've got the general formula, therefore, is C5. Don't forget the formula is double and add two, so H12. OK, how many ways could you OK, arrange five carbons and 10, sorry, 12 hydrogens? OK, now if you are watching this um, at a later point, or I suggest you take the time later on to 
pause this and then try this yourself. Try arranging the um, five carbons and the 12 hydrogens in as many ways you can. What you'll come across is that actually, even though instinctively you want it to be more, there are only three ways of doing it. OK, so there are having them all in a straight line of five. There are having them as a line of four. And the fifth one coming off the second one. Now, to be clear, I could have put it coming off this one if I wanted to. And it would still be the same because what you, it is really important you understand is that, sorry, um, is that it is, um, does matter if that's carbon number two or three, it's the same one, okay? So it doesn't matter if it is drawn off the second one from the right or the second one from the left. It's still the second carbon. And then you've got what I classify as the crucifix arrangement, which is having three in a line and having one going off the central carbon upwards and one coming off the central carbon downwards. So there are three ways of drawing five carbons and 12 hydrogens and them being different to each other. OK, hexane isn't that um, commonly examined, but yet again, only has three different isomers that are possible. OK, so naming them is not dissimilar to how you'd name normal alkanes. So you look at what's coming off. If there's one carbon coming off, you call it a methyl side chain. OK, so you look at the length of the side chain. In this case, it's one, so methyl. You then look at the longest chain, which in this case is five. OK, it's called pent, therefore. And because it's coming off carbon number two, you call it two methyl pentane. Right. You could try naming that. OK, if you pause it and go through a few options and you'd hopefully come up with the correct answer, which is three methyl pentane, because the methyl this time is coming off the third carbon, not the second. Right. Cracking. Um, I know I've only got a minute or two left, but it's extremely important because it is a way of getting the balance between supply and demand. Because if you think back to the first slide of fractional distillation, you get lots of fractions and lots of portions coming off, but some of them are more worth, um, more kind of in demand than others. So what they do is they take the less in demand, less useful ones at the bottom, the longer ones, and they chop them into smaller, more useful ones. And we call that process cracking. OK, so it's used to take a saturated hydrocarbon and chop it into, in the presence of a catalyst and strong heating usually, into smaller, more useful um, sections called alkanes, which is another word, version of itself, and an alkene, which is unsaturated. So it has a double bond present. But it is worth noting, OK, that the number of carbons here is 10 and the number of hydrogens is 22 and combining these two it still makes a total of 10 and it still makes a total of 22. So sticking to the principle you can't destroy atoms and you can't create them. Everything has to balance. Okay now this as always is a presentation that's got past paper questions at the end. Okay so I won't dwell too much but if you go through them to make um, this purposeful, OK, I've given the questions for you and following that question, there will be that mark scheme that follows it. Use this, use these, OK? They will be really useful to prepare you for the assessments that I'm sure your teachers will be throwing at you in the weeks that follow Easter, OK? So take the time, look at the question, have a think about it. You don't have to write it down, you don't have to actually do it, but have a think. Mm, do I know the answer? Check your understanding. Did I get it right? Did I get it wrong? And then move on to the next one. So there are plenty there for you to have a practice on. OK, so just a final word, just good luck over the next few weeks. OK, it's been a rough all ride for you lot um, between year 10 being disrupted and year 11. And I appreciate that. OK, but 
the end goal is there. You just need to now um, knuckle down and hopefully these sessions that you've attended have been somewhat useful in helping you through. OK, so I wish you goodbye. Yeah, and same for me and I wish you good luck. And uh, yeah, thank you for attending. Thanks, Miss Stevens, for an excellent presentation. Good evening.